Antarctica, one of the most isolated places on Earth. It's the coldest, highest and windiest continent. Few animals can live in these frozen wastes. But that hasn't prevented people from trying to survive in these extreme conditions. At her home in the Lake District, Susan Denham-Smith is preparing for the trip of a lifetime. She's planning to be the first British woman to walk across Antarctica on her own, one of the most dangerous and arduous journeys imaginable. It's going to be very, very hard work. I've done a lot of cross-country running and marathon running. After you've done those sort of long distances, you're always looking for another challenge. Her training involves pulling a huge tyre across the fields. When I go across the ice, I'm going to have to take all my equipment and all my food uh, and fuel to cook the food for 100 days with me. So the best way to practice is to simulate dragging a very heavy load behind you. Here I've got a sledge similar to the one I'll be using. And on it I've got a big pair of boots, which are big enough for two or three pairs of socks. A very large pair of gloves to keep my hands warm. A downfield jacket to keep the rest of me warm. My tent's small and lightweight, just enough room for me inside. And again, a sleeping bag that's filled with feathers. But most important of all, the stove, which I need for melting ice to make water for me to drink and to heat up my food. Food provides the energy our bodies need, so the amount and type of food Susan takes will be critical. In science, energy is measured in kilojoules, but food energy can also be measured in calories. Based on her height, age and weight, Susan knows that she needs 2,000 calories a day just to keep her body functioning, to keep her heart beating, her blood flowing and her organs healthy. When she's pulling her sledge, she'll be using an extra 2,000 calories. To keep warm in the freezing conditions of Antarctica, she's going to use about 1,500 calories. For activities like cooking and putting up her tent, she needs a further 500. That makes a total of 6,000 calories of energy to be used every day. A huge amount of energy. So what type of food should she take? Burning a small piece of cream cracker in liquid oxygen shows just how much energy it contains. Food is a store of chemical energy. It's because it's in contact with pure oxygen that this piece of food burns so completely. The body also uses oxygen to release energy from food. A similar but much more controlled reaction takes place in every cell of your body. But do all foods provide the same amount of energy? Peanuts are high in fat. Dried potato is high in carbohydrate. To compare their energy content, we can use a food calorimeter. It's a glass container filled with water and works like this. First, place one gram of dried potato into a small metal crucible. This sits on a heat-proof platform. The calorimeter surrounds the food. At this point, the water inside is at a temperature of 21 Celsius. A small ignition coil gets hot enough to ignite the potato and a flow of oxygen into the space around the food keeps it burning. The hot gases produced rise through the copper coil and heat the water. One gram of potato causes the water to rise from 21 to 25 Celsius. So what happens with one gram of peanuts? This time the water rises from 21 to 29 Celsius. This rise in temperature means that peanuts contain 20 kilojoules per gram, while dried potato contains 10 kilojoules per gram. 
fat makes a big difference to the energy content. Susan needs to carry a hundred days worth of food. She's had to think very carefully about what type of foods to take. Now I know I'm going to need about 25,000 kilojoules of energy per day when I'm in Antarctica. And this is what it would look like in everyday foods. Now I never fit 100 days worth of this on my sledge. So there is an alternative. We could take it in the form of fat or lard, but I wouldn't want to eat this. Would you? So I've put together a diet which covers all my nutritional needs. There's fats in butter and cheese, proteins in nuts and fruit, and carbohydrates, especially in dehydrated expedition rations, which are nutritious, they meet my energy needs, and the whole lot doesn't weigh very much. To make sure she gets the right amount of energy, more than half her rations will be made up of fat. Before the body can release the energy from food, it has to digest it and convert it into glucose. Glucose is the body's main fuel, which is why a glucose drink or a bar of chocolate can give you a quick energy hit. But to release that energy, her body needs a supply of oxygen. Thankfully, in Antarctica, oxygen isn't going to be a problem. But when might it be? When do you need to carry an oxygen supply with you? Oxygen enters the body through the air we breathe in. Inside the lungs, the oxygen comes into contact with blood vessels. Oxygen passes from the air in the lungs into the bloodstream and is picked up by red blood cells. The blood also transports glucose around the body. The blood carries oxygen and glucose to every cell. As the blood passes through tiny capillaries, the oxygen and glucose pass out into the surrounding cells. When the oxygen and glucose meet, they react chemically and slowly release energy. This is respiration. Glucose and oxygen react, releasing energy and producing carbon dioxide and water. constant supply of glucose and oxygen is essential. Which is why paramedics always carry oxygen and glucose to the scene of any accident. The Yorkshire Air Ambulance Service has been called out to someone trapped in a car. The casualty is only semi-conscious. Regardless of the injury, the first thing the paramedics do is give the casualty a good supply of oxygen. Do you suffer with anything, love? You're diabetic. Are you on insulin? This person is diabetic. Her body can't control its blood sugar level on its own. If her blood sugar drops, she can become unconscious. So the treatment is a shot of glucose solution directly into the vein. Without a supply of glucose and oxygen in our bloodstream, we can't survive. Adi Adepitan is a top wheelchair basketball player. He was in the British Paralympic team in Sydney. Respiration is important to everyone. When the oxygen in the air you breathe in and the glucose in food react in your cells, energy is released. The energy produced when these things react is used all over the body. But what happens to the carbon dioxide and the water from the respiration reaction? Well, the water ends up in the air you breathe out, and so does the carbon dioxide. 
It's an invisible gas and you can't see it, but sports scientists can measure it. Now this is Vicky, our sports scientist for the day. What's up? <laughs> Now by comparing the air I breathe in with the air I breathe out, she can work out just how efficiently my body's working. And as an elite athlete, I need to get as much energy as possible from every breath I take in. First, she collects the air I breathe out in one minute while I sit here and chill out. And believe you me, this is the easy part of the test. Oh. Next, I have to do some work. This is what's called a submaximal level of activity. Again, she collects the air I exhale in one minute. Finally, I have to really go for it. Push it to the max. Excellent. Keep working then, Addy. This is hard on my muscles. Eventually, they're working so hard, the oxygen can't get there quick enough, which causes a buildup of lactic acid and that's when it hurts. I can only do this kind of exercise for a few minutes before I have to stop. Next it's time for Vicky to analyse the contents of the bags. How does the air I breathe in compare with the air I breathe out? Air is a mixture of gases, normally 20.9% oxygen and 0.05% carbon dioxide. But once inside the body, it doesn't stay that way. At rest, the percentage of oxygen in the air Addy breathes out has dropped from 20.9 to 17.7%. His body is using oxygen. But the amount of carbon dioxide has risen from 0.05 to 2.5%. At a submax level of activity, the amount of oxygen Addy breathes out has fallen slightly, but the amount of carbon dioxide has risen to 3.6%. Now while Vicky's working out what all this means, take a look at what's happening inside the body. Carbon dioxide and water travel in the blood to the lungs. Here they pass into the lungs' air space. The lungs allow gases to exchange. As carbon dioxide passes out of the blood, oxygen passes in. How did I do? Finally, Vicky's calculated that the changes in the air that Addy breathes out means his body is working more efficiently. Yes, wicked European Championships, here I come. The more energy you need, the higher the rate of respiration, the more fuel your body is using. Which is why Addy and Susan will probably eat a lot more food than you or me. Different people have different needs. Take a pregnant woman, a couple of growing teenagers, a builder, an office worker and an elderly woman. Which of these do you think requires the most amount of energy per day? About 70% of the energy you use every day merely keeps your body working, keeps your heart beating, keeps you warm and your organs functioning. If you're doing anything else, your body needs extra energy. But we're all different. Different ages, sizes, shapes and lifestyles. Which means we all have different energy needs. On average, males of a similar age and lifestyle tend to need more energy than females. Active manual workers need more than office workers. Not surprisingly, an elderly woman needs less energy than a growing teenager. Growing uses a lot of energy. So who needs more energy here? A pregnant woman or a growing teenager? It's actually the teenage boy. Generally, the total amount of energy used in a day depends on how active you are. It's important to try and balance the amount of energy your body gains from your food with the amount of energy your body uses. If energy intake outweighs energy used, your body stores the surplus energy as fat. Mark Cullen used to be very overweight. This is him a couple of years ago when he first joined the Carnegie International Weight Loss Camp. 
Well, I've weighed 18 stone when I first went to the camp. And it's really bad because I couldn't actually do anything. I couldn't run. I just couldn't do anything at all. The latest figures in the UK say that one in three children are overweight and one in ten children are obese. That clearly has implications for medical risks. Teenagers who are overweight can face many problems in later life, such as heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, and they may not live as long. But why are young people becoming overweight? They eat, but they don't exercise. And I went to a camp first year, and I, I ate a lot, but I'd never like, exercised. Second year, I actually got it into my head that I'm going to eat but exercise and burn it off and that's what I've been doing ever since. The main aims of the camp are trying to get kids to have fun being physically active and enjoy it and, and do it because they get a buzz out of it. We calculate how many calories does each person need on a daily basis and that's the amount of food that we provide for them. What that then does is it allows us to use the exercise to cause the weight loss on the camp program and that's really how we tip the balance in our favour. Lack of food tips the balance the other way. Energy intake becomes smaller than energy used. Some people go on diets to slim on purpose. But losing weight can actually be an illness. Anorexia nervosa is a, a psychological disorder that causes physical complications. A person with anorexia will have a fear of um, eating and gaining weight. They will have a fear of normal body weight and a fear of food. Claire first went into hospital with anorexia at the age of 10. It's a dangerous illness. My heart could have gone into failure at any moment because there was no fat on my body. Um, so your body starts to eat its own muscle, and one of your main muscles being your heart. I almost died. I weighed five and a half stone at my worst. Many people with anorexia nervosa, I mean, they will restrict their calorie intake, some people only eating 250 calories a day. Um, therefore, whilst they're extremely tired, they're at least 1,100 calories just to sleep at night. And people with anorexia also tend to exercise a lot as well. So again, they're, they're burning more energy that they haven't got. So eventually there's a deficit. It's a deep psychological problem and people cope by using food. It's actually an addiction, like people misuse alcohol, misuse drugs. People also misuse food as a way of coping and controlling what's going on in their life. It is treatable. You can get better. And the earlier you catch it, the easier it is to treat. But it's important you go and seek help straight away rather than leave it too long. Remember, we all need different amounts of energy for life. Are you getting your energy balance right?